Welcome to The Offering with Jerry Hara, the show where we can have a quiet and frank discussion as adults about the things that matter to me, or at least that I think matter to me. Please take a moment to subscribe to our show wherever you get fine podcasts, and hey, stay up to date on future episodes. Hey, what's up? It's your pal, Jerry Hara, and this week on The Offering, we talk about everyone's favorite installment into the Indiana Jones quadrilogy, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Hello and welcome to this week's Offering with Jerry Hara. In case you have lost track of who and what and where, I am Jerry Hara. Thank you for joining us. Hey, how you doing? I, I hope you had a... Hope you had a good week. Hope you had a good day. I'm always making sure that you're okay. Now, on to this week's offering, because there is no way, there is no preamble to get past... Uh, <laughs> Ooh, boy. Well, celebrating its 13th anniversary this year is the film known as Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And for a lot of people, this is a problematic film. Oh, also, to let you folks know as you're listening, we are outside, uh, and it is beautiful. It's a, it's a beautiful day. It's sunny. The birds are singing. Very warm. Very happy. That's, that's where I want you to be right now, um, because, Jesus Christ. My brother was saying before that these Indiana Jones films, like, Spielberg was burnt out at this point, that George Lucas probably should have directed this film probably would have been a better choice. There is a lot of interesting things regarding the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It has a very troubled production history. It's one of those movies that was so long gestating because really look at the timeline. Um, the trilogy of Indiana Jones works because it, it basically is contained to the 1980s. You've got one, two, and three, and they're all made, you know, 81 it was like 85, I think, or 84 for uh, the second film. And then the third film is 89. Now think about that. 1989 to 2008. All that time. Uh, we had seen with some of the video games, like uh, there was the quest or the lost quest for Atlantis or whatever the fuck it was. And they had all these ideas. And largely what it was was George Lucas was, he was swinging for the fences. And he's like, yeah, this is it. We're going to take Indy into the atomic age. He definitely wanted to go, not even for science fiction, but I think more in a fantasy direction was where it was all headed. A lot of controversial stuff with this movie. More recently, I just have to preface this, they had wanted the Chris's to take over the role of Indiana Jones. Um, and that's another question we have to ask ourselves. Can we? are we able to recast Indiana Jones? Like, it, because then we enter James Bond territory and it's like, Ooh, Chris Pratt is, no, I, you know, Chris Hemsworth could do it. But the thing is, his accent is so pronounced that it, you know, you know, I mean, <laughs> he's going to like do the Thor voice. He's, he's like, he's like, oh, I am Dr. Jones. You know, like <laughs> it's not going to work. It's me, the American, uh, what am I? I'm a professor. A professor of archaeology. Uh, no one's going to buy that. Although I'm sure he would look great, uh, you know, doing it. But sometimes that's just not enough, folks. There was a lot of controversy with this film because uh, Indy was given a son. And here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing with Jerry Hara, which is a new show that we're presenting weekly. But here's the rub. Okay, the rub is this. Very plainly and simply. When you introduce a son or a daughter, it's the progeny of a famous character. The thing is, you're either going to be going on adventures with this character, or we're trying to kind of under the table say, hey, you like Mutt Lang, which is the name of his son in this film. What a terrible name. And then they they dressed him like Marlon Brando. Oh, God. Oh, what? A, Mutt Lang? So you go from Indiana Jones, which sounds so exciting and thrilling, to Mutt Lang. Uh, Shia was, was under attack, but Shia was hot. Hot. He was opening movies. He was doing all kinds of stuff. He had Disturbia. 
you know, and then obviously the Transformers films. That's where uh, Spielberg got him. But he was hot. 2008. Ooh, red, red hot. That Shia LaBeouf. You couldn't so hot. You as hot as magma. Okay. Harrison Ford was adamant to make this film because he got to wield Indiana Jones' famous whip. Um, Paramount executives basically wanted the weapon to be a computer-generated image because of the new movie safety rules, but Ford branded the rule ridiculous. Ultimately, Harrison Ford gets his way, and ladies and gentlemen, you were not forced to sit through a fucking CGI whip. That's right. That's all Ford, all day. Basically, the producers were like, hey, look, we need some more jokes in this movie about how Indiana Jones is old because we're all getting old here, Harrison. We got to tell the old man jokes. Um, they wanted to reduce the American paranoia about aging. And Spielberg and Lucas put it very front and center saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, he's old, but we don't need all these these uh, these old jokes and essentially, you know, Harrison Ford must have his pride and his ego. And I don't think, I don't know, if you did all those old man jokes, it would have been stupid. It, you know, it would have been like, what was he going to do? Split his pants? And like, warp, warp. you know, like, you, no one wants to see that. Uh, when filming the scene where Indiana Jones drives a truck through a wall, things did not go as expected. Uh, timed explosive, timed explosives were used, but one explosive did not go off and it landed in the seat next to Harrison Ford. Yeah. Um, basically Karen Allen at this point, Karen Allen wasn't even aware that her character was in the script because it was so heavily guarded. No one knew at that point in time that she was going to appear. Uh, Spielberg called Karen Allen in 2007 saying, Hey, look, it's been announced. We're going to make Indiana Jones 4. And guess what? You're in it again. And Karen greeted Spielberg the same way that Marion greeted Indiana back in Tibet. You know, with given, obviously, it's no, I mean, look, I, I'm not going to, all right, let's, let's rake up the mud here. Famously, Karen Allen and Spielberg were involved. Okay. Karen Allen was like red hot in the 80s. She did Starman. She was in Animal House. She was in a lot of friggin' movies. And then after the whole romantic entanglement with Spielberg, her career just kind of fizzled out, uh, which is really one of these crazy things. Uh, I mean, again, if you want to speculate on that, speculate all you want. I mean, hey, I don't know if, you know, Spielberg puts the call out. I don't see him as an evil man who's like, you don't fucking hire Callan Allen. <laughs> Callan Allen. You don't fucking hire Karen Allen. And George Lucas was there too. And he was like, hey, Hey, you, you stop that. You, you don't do that, Stephen. You don't uh, you don't threaten people when they uh, don't hire, you, you know, hey, Stephen. Uh, no, the reality of it is, is that my George Lucas impression is, is basically Kermit the Frog. But uh, yeah, several, <laughs> several weeks into production, Harrison Ford saw a blonde woman on the set and asked who she was. He was told it was Kate Blanchett. She was in the movie who he had never seen out of costume and did not recognize uh, her in, in any way. Um, originally, Indiana was supposed to be going up against an uprising of ex-Nazis, but Steven Spielberg felt he could not treat the Nazis lightly after directing Schindler's List. So this script was pretty much completely destroyed and not used, and George Lucas also felt that the 1950s decade would have to take into account the Cold War, and when he heard, uh, you know, Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin had been interested in crystal skulls, it it basically turned the Soviets into the next villain. So it was kind of the natural progression of time in the timeline of the Indiana Jones universe. Like, where is this going to take place? And that's where we get like Mutt Lang, and he's doing Marlon Brando from The Wild One. And I think at that time, you know, Elvis rock and roll was was really coming into the American public consciousness and. Yeah, I could see him, but here's the thing. It's just weird when you rip off somebody who's as iconic as Marlon Brando in that role. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, and you have to call him Sir. Anybody who's calling him Sean Connery, it's not Sean Connery. you got to call him Sir Sean Connery. Uh, he was approached for a cameo appearance as Henry Jones Sr., but Indiana's father felt that he had turned it down, finding retirement too enjoyable. 
Oh, there we go. It is not Mutt Lang. It is Mutt Williams. Uh, this has been brought to my attention. For all you people out there who are keeping track, it is, in fact, Mutt Williams. Um, Kate Blanchett and Harrison Ford never met before this movie. The first time that they were introduced was on the day of filming. And, and it's just, it's one of these weird things. Spielberg didn't even want to shoot this movie in digital format. Um, the studio forced him. And uh, he said, look, I, I really don't want to do this. And then George came in again, George Lucas. And he said, hey, Stephen, hey, um, you know what? I know you want to shoot this in film, but I think it's better if you shoot this uh, digitally. You know, I, I'm doing these Star Wars films and uh, digitally they look beautiful. You know, it's cheaper. It's easier. Sometimes I like to just have a Diet Coke and uh, let Jar Jar do his thing. You know, let him do some improvisation. Ooh. Uh, he, oh, God, Mutt Lang is a music producer. That's right. Jesus Christ. Oh, I think he was married to Shania Twain. Yeah, there you go. John Reese davies noted uh, racist, was approached to reprise his character Sala in a very brief cameo in the wedding scene, but he turned it down. Why the fuck would he turn it down? Like, what, what else? Like, he's like, no, there's a, there's a reunion going on with Sliders. I have to be there. It's priority, Andy. And you're like, hey, maybe you could do, you know, you could find some time to do this. And, uh, you know, Sliders, you know, hey, look, we fucking made you. We made you. And we can break you, too. You like that show, Sliders, you got? F fuck you, Sala. George probably never even knew his real name. He just kept calling him Sala. Uh, he just wanted Sala to appear as a crowd member in the church. And uh, John Reese davies basically said that it would cheapen the character. Ultimately, Spielberg made the decision for him to just go fuck himself. <laughs> John Reese davies he's like, he's like, I am an actor, and I, I think that this should be played a certain way. And Steven Spielberg's like, yeah, go fuck yourself. That's gangster. Um, <laughs> it's crazy because there were a lot of questions as to what this film would be about, and ultimately they go for the Crystal Skull angle, because, uh, you know, there was also the, the whole thing of, like, Nazis, they were looking for power, but really, because now we're not dealing with Nazis, it's the 1950s, we're dealing with, you know, the Cold War, Soviet Union, and essentially what they were looking to do was ascertain some kind of a power from these Crystal Skulls. Now, as we all know, this isn't a spoiler alert. If you're listening to this episode, hey, guess what? This movie was made 13 years ago, and if you didn't have to suffer through it with the rest of us, yeah, it, it, it's a fucking travesty. Aliens show up at the end of this movie. And that was the moment. There is a moment as a film fan. I remember the theater I saw this in. I can tell you where I was sitting in the theater. And that second when the fucking aliens come out, and they look like the aliens, the greys that we saw in... um. Oh, my God. Signs. They look like the... the well, yeah, kind of. Uh, but they, they look close encounters, they, they more look like. And that was the moment where I was like, you know, it was like the SpongeBob meme. I was like, all right, I'm going to head out of the Indiana Jones franchise. Like, that's it. That was the, the final straw. Like, I literally felt like at that moment, and I wasn't on anything, to my knowledge... I felt like I had an out-of-body experience when the aliens showed up. Like, I was like, this is really happening. Like, this is it. Now, one of the pitches early on was to send him to the lost city of Atlantis. Okay, so I don't know. If I had to choose aliens over fucking fish people, I'm gonna choose the aliens. Oh, boy. Jesus. This movie was gonna feature some tributes to Marcus Brody. Uh, the late Denholm Elliott. A portrait of him is shown on the wall in the hallway when Dean Charles is having a conversation with Indiana. Uh, a picture of him is in Indiana Jones' desk at his house, and next to a picture of his father, uh, Henry Jones Sr. So it was nice that they, they paid homage to him, and I, I pretty much popped for that scene. I was like, oh boy, I love Marcus Brody. But he's dead, so he can't be in this movie. Meanwhile, we got to deal with the fucking diva that is uh, John Reese davies noted fucking racist. He's a wacko. Look it up. You will have a, a fucking rabbit hole of stupidity. I have to do the Sliders reunion. It's very important for my career. This is the only movie in the entire franchise which Indy does not fire his pistol. I don't know why. Uh, maybe, maybe they just didn't want to do Harrison Ford with gun violence, but... I would probably just think that maybe it was an afterthought. I, I don't fucking know. 
this movie was delivered to theaters with a combination lock. The combination wasn't provided until the day of the first showing, and code names were slapped on the side of the reels that said Bandwagon and Turbo, which were the secret code names to sneak Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull into theaters because of the burgeoning popularity of bootlegging uh, DVDs at the time. Uh, according to George Lucas, uh, in a special effects documentary that was included on the DVD, he had written into the screenplay that the third act with the fire ants that end up uh, eating the Russians, he wanted to do gigantic flesh-eating ants in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> and that was lifted directly from an abandoned uh, screenplay because this was in the script for uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And then he had that idea, and, and basically Steven Spielberg shot him down on it. So he tried to get the giant ants again in this film. Jesus Christ, you wonder what happened to this guy. You wonder why everybody thinks this guy... I love him. I love George Lucas, but... Ooh, Jesus. There's certain things. You can't have gigantic ants in Indiana Jones. You can't. It just gets too weird. But the... The fact that they were trying to shoehorn, and that's a lot of what this was because they were thinking this was a send-off to the films, and they're like, "Hey, you know what? We're gonna, we're just gonna, we're gonna throw everything in the kitchen sink that we always wanted to do." But luckily, someone had enough restraint to tell George Lucas, "Please do not put gigantic ants in this movie. It will completely take people out of it." Uh, security on this film was incredibly tight. Uh, one of the measures to prevent information leaks regarding the screenplay, uh, as far as the daily call sheets, for example, Harrison Ford would be called Star, and it would be a star symbol. And then Kate Blanchett would play Mean Girl. And the reason that they did this, uh, Karen Allen was listed as the damsel. Um, and the reason that they did this was basically to throw people off for spoilers. Like, for one reason or another, Spielberg was very afraid, so was Lucas, that this film was going to get spoiled. Um, hey, in case you weren't keeping track, we get to see in the Hangar 51, we, we get to see the Ark, the uh, the proverbial uh, lost Ark. Well, it's, it's not lost anymore. And it, here's the thing. Every time they do a callback to one of these things, when they do a callback to Raiders of the Lost Ark or they do a callback to The Last Crusade, you're like, wow, those are better movies. Every fucking time, just slapping you in the face. Um, when they were doing press junkets for this movie, Spielberg famously told Shia LaBeouf not to pick his nose in public. Also, LaBeouf criticized the movie uh, to the press several times after it came out. I feel like I dropped the ball on the legacy. You know, people love this character. They love and cherish Indiana Jones. You, you get to see monkey swinging and things like that, but you can't blame it on the writer. You can't blame it on Steven Spielberg. But the actor's job is to make it come alive and make it work, and I just couldn't do it. So that's my fault. Simple. The reason that Mutt Williams doesn't work is Shia LaBeouf's fault. LaBeouf went on to say, saying later that this movie basically destroyed his relationship with Spielberg. Uh, you know, it, it came to a crashing halt and was largely one of the reasons that he did not continue in the Transformers franchise. You know, Spielberg told me there's a time to be a human being and have an opinion, and there's a time to sell cars. And LaBeouf said at the time, it bought me freedom. Transformers bought me freedom. But it also killed my spirits because this was a dude that I looked up to. Spielberg was like a sensei to me. He was my hero. Harrison Ford also called Shia LaBeouf a fucking idiot for criticizing the movie to the press as well. I think he's a complete fucking idiot, Ford said. As an actor, I think it's my obligation to support the film and support the people making it without making a complete ass of myself. So it's no surprise to me that LaBeouf, uh, after all this, LaBeouf was fired from Indiana Jones franchise. Ooh, that's some serious shit. Like, <laughs> that's not good because, like, here's the thing, uh, you know, Mutt Williams is supposed to continue this franchise and then the guy who's handing you the franchise, tells you to go fuck yourself. And this is an interesting tidbit. The scene at the end where, you know, um, Indiana Jones' hat goes off and the door opens, they added that, like, 
post haste because they they were like they were so unsure of dealing with Shia LaBeouf and and such a bad experience with him that they did it because the proverbial door swings open in the church and they're basically saying like oh, okay we we got to meet Mutt Williams but we're leaving the door open here and 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 if if he if he I feel like I feel like and here's the thing: they're making this new Indiana Jones. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen's been been cast. He'll probably be playing the villain. He probably argued, you know, with all of them. Spielberg's not directing it. Uh, the guy who directed Logan is directing it. Um, the real the reality of it is, is like, I wouldn't be surprised if they pull a Pucci with with, with Mutt Williams, and the, and like it's like you know it's like the beginning of the new Indiana Jones movie, and you see someone who vaguely looks like Shia LaBeouf, and he just gets shot in the head, you know, during the Vietnam War. That would be really cool, but it'll never. <laughs> Will never happen. You're listening to The Offering with Jerry Hara. Got a question or a story you want to share with me? It might be featured in a future episode. Email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter at Jerry Hara. I'm also on Instagram. You can find me there at Jerry Hara. Rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts and you might find your review in an upcoming episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to The Offering. Now back to the show. Um... Jesus Christ. Do you know what this movie cost? This movie cost $185 million. Oh, my God. Jesus Christ. Like, it had some special effects and stuff. But what the... F- you know, like, what kind of catering is on this film? Um, and as of 2020, this is still the most expensive movie that Steven Spielberg has ever directed. Uh, the jungle chase sequence was actually filmed in Hawaii. Uh, you know, it, it was the closest thing to a primitive looking jungle that the crew could find. This is also the only Indiana Jones movie not to receive any Oscar nominations. Ooh, Jesus. It's like from top to bottom with the kingdom of the crystal skull. It's just a disaster. Um, wow. Okay. Th- they basically, Janos Kaminsky, if you know who he is, he's a cinematographer, um, and they wanted to replace the retired cinematographer, which was uh, Douglas Sacomb, who had done uh, the previous three Indiana Jones movies. So Kaminsky was brought on to take over, and basically uh, it was not, he wasn't warmly received by Spielberg, by George Lucas. So right from the jump, the guy who's lensing your movie, you don't get along with him. And he's also replaced a beloved cinematographer. And your cinematographer really is your collaborator. They're helping you try to bring out the best in your movie if you've, if you've got a good cinematographer. Uh, this was not... <laughs> um, basically, the way that Janos Kamiski had seen this film was he wanted to modernize... Um, Indiana Jones, a lot of fast cut fight scenes and things like that. He was, he was trying to bring a different sensibility to the film. And so was the editor. And at this point, uh, everybody had to swallow their pride and say, look, Steven Spielberg is the producer. He's the director, you know, George Lucas. These are people that I admire and uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with it. And, uh, basically after that, uh, Janos, after this film, Janos Kaminsky has yet to talk to George Lucas or Steven Spielberg. Like, it, whatever happened on the set of this film has basically created a rift between those people. Um, Jesus Christ. You know, one of the worst things in this movie is the beginning when he gets in the fridge. It's the infamous nuke the fridge scene. Okay. All right. I, I, I really... I. I I, I need some Vicodin. I, I, I need some Xanax because I, I'm just, I'm going to have a fucking coronary here. Uh, nuke the fridge in the colloquial English language is now a replacement for jump the shark, referring to the scene in which Indiana Jones, you know, he survives a nuclear explosion. So yeah, nuke the fridge really never took off. People tried to make nuke the fridge take off. It, it, it didn't. You can't. You know, it's like, it, it's like, stop trying to make fetch a thing. You know, you, you just can't do it. The poster art for the movie was painted by Drew Struzan, the same artist who had created the poster art for the first two Indiana Jones movies. 
uh, which is always a good thing. Um, you know, he took over from the original Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark poster, uh, Richard Amsell, who had died in 1985. In an interview with Empire Magazine in 2011, Steven Spielberg admitted that he never liked the MacGuffin of the movie. It was George Lucas's idea, as he said. Spielberg only put it in the movie because of a friendship with Lucas. He said in the interview, I am loyal to my best friend. George is my best friend. That's kind of sweet. And he writes a story he believes in. Even if I don't believe in it, I'm going to shoot the movie the way George envisioned it. Jesus Christ. So basically, this whole movie is held together. This shit show that is known as Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Lost Skull. This shit show is held together by the friendship of these two men. That's largely what it seems. This entire production is incredibly troubled and incredibly expensive. For nostalgic purposes, the Paramount Pictures screen was the same, bleh, the same style uh, before the opening credits, uh, except that Gulf Western was replaced by Viacom, because now that those were their overlords. Uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, look, there's a lot of things not to like um, about this movie. One of the first things that appears in this movie, this is the first Indiana Jones movie that has a Lucasfilm logo right in the beginning of the film. Uh, on the first days of shooting, Steven Spielberg held a toast with the crew, thanking them for their hard work and helping to bring Indiana Jones back to the big screen after 19 years. Now, it happens a lot. We see in Hollywood they keep making sequels to movies long after their expiration date. As we get this new, you know, we have we have a brand new 4K box set of the original films, in, including this film. Um, they did, they did 4k scans for, for the trilogy. And then this film only got a 2k scan. It was, it's the only one in the box set that doesn't have a 4k scan. And I think that says a lot about what they think of the film. Um, this movie was just like basically George Lucas and Steven Spielberg hanging out, you know, Harrison Ford, I guess he gets along with them for the right price. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's. <laughs> it's one of these things where I, I can't believe that this film was even made. I mean, they had shutdowns in the middle of production. They had all kinds of things that went wrong with this film. Um, the last time that Steven Spielberg had been at Khan was for E.T. And there were some critics at Khan. Most people liked it, but there were some critics that savaged him and said this is a bullshit piece of of commercial pop work so spielberg never went back to con so he returns after 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 1982 not going to con and he brings indiana jones and the kingdom of the crystal skull what fucking hubris of all the movies you could have gone back to con with schindler's list but you went back with the fourth Indiana Jones movie. What balls. Mr. Senor Spielbergo, you have some serious cojones. And I respect that shit. Oh, my God. This is... It, it's just... It goes on and on. You know, everything that went uh, wrong in this movie. Believe it or not, Michelle Yeoh was rumored to be up for a role in the movie and had discussed the possibility to... Uh, an enthusiastic Steven Spielberg on the set of Memoirs of a Geisha. So instead of Mutt Williams, what they were going to try to do was put in Michelle Yeoh. Obviously, she knows Kung Fu, so we kind of know what direction this is. And I think that's kind of interesting um, and much more progressive than we saw a short round. <laughs> you know, so it's it kind of like to pay back for... Um, because let's face it, I mean, now you watch Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It's a fucking problematic journey. It, it's ridiculous. Why are there Indians eating monkey brains? Like, it, it just... And short round, oh, you know what? I don't even want to talk about it. I, I don't even want to get into it, but the semantics of it. Hey, I love the movie. I watch it. It is what it is. But, yeah. The Kingdom of... Before... Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was chosen as the subtitle of the movie. The original title of the original script was Indiana Jones and the Saucer Men. Ooh, that's a big oof. 
because that was George Lucas's original choice for the title, and he had several other titles, but he was sticking to his guns and saying Indiana Jones and the Saucer Men is the way to go. Yeah, come on, come on, Steven. It's the Saucer Men. It's, it's going to be. Remember all those movies we loved in the 1950s? Well, here's the thing, George. It's not the 1950s, and the Saucer Men are, are pervert, you know, like whatever. They're not going to fly. I'm sorry. Ooh, that was bad. It was a bad pun. Um,. There were all these uh, titles that had been thrown around. And uh, at one point, the screenwriter, David Kep came in and said, we should just call this film Indiana Jones and the Son of Indiana Jones. Jesus Christ. Eventually, all three settled on the movie's final title, with Lucas himself insisting that the word kingdom be in the title. And then uh, Steven Spielberg and the, the producer and the writer agreeing on Kingdom. Well, Lucas had to have the Kingdom, but Spielberg had to have Crystal Skull because he thought it was, it was the most mysterious way. And at that time, his kids were really into Ed Hardy clothing. Oh, Jesus Christ. This movie is just a fucking shit show from top to bottom. Ooh. This is the only movie in the Indiana Jones franchise where no character says, holy smokes. See, that's how you, that's how you, that's, you know, it's said by Sala, it's said by Short Round, and then it's even uh, said by River Phoenix in the, uh, the beginning of The Last Crusade, the flashback. Uh, this is the first movie um, that Steven Spielberg had done that was kind of a real genre movie. Um, for DreamWorks, uh, this, this was the first film that was produced by DreamWorks, um, you know, and one of those things where they distributed it, but at the same time, it was the, it was the first sequel that he had ever done since the Lost World. So yeah, it, it's kind of one of those things because at that point, like if you look at the output of Spielberg at that time, he was doing a lot of original movies. He was doing a lot of stuff that was you know, out of his wheelhouse, he, he kind of like, you had stuff like Minority Report, which was like incredibly, you know, that's a great movie. Go back and, and, and if anything that you've learned from this episode, please go watch Minority Report. It's a fantastic film. Uh, this is not, this is not, but we had to do this. You know, I had to do this. You know, I had to bring him out for this shit. We had to bring out Indiana Jones 4. We're in the backyard. I got I got Pete the producer. I got my brother to my right. I think he's falling asleep at this point. Uh, the refrigerator nuke scene was a direct ripoff of the original Back to the Future, where Marty and Doc were engaging in time travel by jumping into a refrigerator near a nuclear bomb site. Um, Spielberg liked that idea so much that he couldn't use it in Back to the Future, and he, he tried to get Robert Zemeckis to do it, and. He recycled, so the nuke the fridge thing is a recycled bit that was supposed to be in Back to the Future and never got used. That is just, ooh, oh my God. Oh God, yeah, Jesus Christ, ooh. There were going to be flashbacks in this movie of uh, Mutt growing up, and they were essentially going to insert um, Mutt Lang into one, like what they did with River Phoenix being like, he's like an Eagle Scout or he's a Boy Scout or something. They were going to try to show how Mutt, Mutt Williams grew up and what occurred in his life. Like his, that was going to be the cold open. And I'm glad they didn't choose to do that because that sounds like the stupidest thing that they could have done. But in, instead we open up, you know, and George, not George Lucas. I wish George Lucas was in the fridge. It would, it would have saved us from a lot of bad stuff. I mean, ultimately this is the first time too, that they had gotten an Indiana Jones movie. I mean, okay. If you want to get technical about it, the young Indiana Jones Chronicles was 1992. So that was the last real Indiana Jones project. Um, you know, and I still think they, with young Indiana Jones, it would have been funny if they shot wraparounds with Harrison Ford. He's like, let me tell you the story. <laughs> I, but you know what? At that time, he was still so red hot. He was such a box office draw. Uh, there was no way. There was, you don't have, they didn't have Harrison Ford money. You know, there's, there's two types of money. You got money and you got Harrison Ford money. That's like, you know, Jesus Christ. Oh man, this movie from top to bottom it is is just an absolute 
train wreck. I mean, I, I, I can't believe, like, and here's the thing. The more you look into it, the more you look into it, the, the, the more there is. Um, Mutt Williams in the original screenplay was a nerdy kind of character and was based after George Lucas. George Lucas decided to make him Indiana's son. Originally, he was not. Mutt Williams was a nerdy character who was a sidekick, but he was not Indiana Jones' son. He was intended to just be a comedic foil to Indiana Jones in this movie. So George says, you know, I, I, I appreciate that you've based this character off of me, but I'd like to make him a little tougher, you know, a little more like, a, you know, like Marlon Brando and the Wild One. So the screenwriter basically turned Mutt Williams into Marlon Brando and the Wild One right down to the haircut and the motorcycle, even the way he wears his jeans. Um, oh, boy, it just gets worse and worse. Uh, <laughs> originally, it was going to be Sir Sean Connery, Short Round, <laughs> well, you know, Indy's father, Short Round, Sala, and Willie Scott were all supposed to be in the wedding scene. Guess who appeared? Okay. Okay, time's up. None of them. Because they all fucking hate Steven Spielberg for one reason or another. I mean, I get it. He was trying to get his ex-wife. And at that point, the kid who played Short Round was just like, like, what would he be, like 30 years old at that point? 35, 40? I mean, would we even know? You know, it's kind of one of those things like the end of uh, Avengers Endgame. There's that kid. And it's like, who the hell is that kid? And it's like, oh, that's the kid from Iron Man 3. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, I don't give a shit about that. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the body count in this film is 47. 18 of those kills were made by Indiana Jones. Just, just so we're all, uh, we're all on the same, um, th the same page here. Uh, this, is, this is what's insane. The first draft of this script was written by George Lucas in 1983. It gets shelved and, and never used. In 1995, a second draft is written by Jeffrey Bohm, simply called Indy 4. And it basically, in this film, we have Indiana searching for Noah's Ark. And it becomes more of a biblical thing. Um, and basically, in 1996, we get our third draft. And this, all, this was basically written um, around the time of Independence Day. So they're like, hey, aliens are hot. So now we, 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 we go from, you know, the whole... Th we just go right into Aliens by 1996 to ape off of that. Uh, Lucas basically re rejected the script. Um, originally, Frank Darabont had written a script. And uh, Lucas was not into Darabont's script at all. So they got David uh, David Cope to to uh, do the writing duties on this one, and there's a lot of people that say that you know like they wouldn't be able to put like they couldn't get away with pushing Darabont. Darabont's too stern and set in his ways. Like he'll push back. He doesn't care who he's writing for. He'll push back. But Cope was kind of like, "What do you want, George? You want me to do this?" And it was the same thing. Like so, Spielberg and George Lucas are both coming to the screenwriter and saying, "Like, hey, this is my idea," and he's just trying to do the best he can with, with this job. And I, I, it's look, Spielberg and Lucas are my heroes, but it's an unenviable task to write that and serve two masters. You want to work with one famous legendary dude? Let's work with one famous legendary dude. This movie features a number of callbacks to better films. And, uh, you know, I have to say to myself, um, they were going to do a lot of things in this film. But this is the absolute most reprehensible and ended up getting cut from the film. So in the final sequence of the film, the aliens appear in the Crystal Skulls. Originally, what was going to happen was the aliens were going to summon the dead souls of the Nazis from Raiders of the Lost Ark and they would lead a siege that would collapse the place. And at that point, because everybody was exhausted from filming this movie, they said, you know what? This movie's got a lot of shit. It's got Mutt Williams swinging like a monkey. It's got fire ants that eat people. But ghost Nazis is where we draw the line. 
okay? You got to draw the line somewhere, and it's ghost Nazis. Ladies and gentlemen, this week's offering was all about Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Lost Skulls. And I think, wait, the king, wait, what is it? The Kingdom of the Lost Skulls? No, it's the Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls. Jesus Christ. What a terrible film. What a terrible way for us to spend our Saturday afternoon. We could have done so many other fun things, but here we are fucking around with the worst Indiana Jones movie of them all. And we found out that aside from gigantic ants, aside from John Rhys Davies wanting his way, that they almost put ghost Nazis. And I gotta say, out of all the dumb shit that is in this movie, ghost Nazis are the least of our problems. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Jerry Horror. This has been The Offering. I hope you have enjoyed. Uh, peace of mind is priceless. And don't forget, get at me on social media. That way you can argue with me, tell you that you love this movie. It's a terrible film. I tried to find good things. But Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls. Is it skulls or skull? The Kingdom of the Crystal Because there was a bunch of them. There's a bunch of skulls. So it's skulls. It's fucking plural. Ladies and gentlemen... Go cop that 4K Blu-ray set. Tell me what you think. And don't forget, folks, peace of mind is priceless. You've been listening to The Offering with Jerry Hara. I'm very sorry. Produced by Pete Pugh. If you have a question or a story you want to share with me, we'd love to hear from you. You can email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit us up at Twitter at jerryhara or on Instagram at jerryhara. You get in the picture? Subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are provided for you and your family. I want you to enjoy. Just join us next time for another offer.